In 1983, Argentina saw the end of a brutal military dictatorship that had killed and disappeared up to 30,000 people. In the years that followed, forensic anthropologists worked with the families of the disappeared to exhume and identify human remains from mass graves. This operation was momentous. The forensic anthropologists were investigating serious abuses of human rights through the analysis of remains, with the hope of one day bringing the perpetrators to trial. But they had another goal, to ease the suffering of the living by identifying and returning the remains of the dead to their families. It was from that time that the work of forensic anthropologists really began to take on a humanitarian function. Since the operation in Argentina, Forensic investigations of mass graves have become an almost standard response to mass violence. Similar investigations have taken place in Rwanda, Guatemala, South Africa and the former Yugoslavia, to name just a few. The Argentinian investigation marked the beginning of this era, but these events are part of a much bigger story about the humanitarian interest in the mass dead. Dr. Claire Moon has been exploring this history. She's also been investigating the current challenges and innovations in the forensics field in Mexico today. This explosion of forensic activity in the latter part of the 20th century really put the mass dead victims of atrocity at the forefront of human rights inquiries. And the project's really aiming to explore this forensic phenomenon. And the question of whether it started to confer special rights upon the dead. And if so, what kinds of rights? Can we now argue, for example, that the dead have human rights? The project's really interested in investigating, both historically and specifically in the context of contemporary Mexico, how all this forensic activity is changing our relationship with these dead and how it's refashioning our sense of responsibility to the dead. This is the 1858 Battle of Solferino the last battle of the Austro-Hungarian Wars. Swiss businessman and activist Henri Dunant wrote a memoir of the event documenting the terrible conditions on the battlefield. The experience led Dunant to set up the Red Cross. The Red Cross is the arch-protagonist of modern humanitarianism, and Solferino is especially important because it marks the moment from which the mass dead started to be the subject of humanitarian interest and concern. This, for me, is where the story begins. And it's quite a different starting point from other accounts, which really begin the story in Argentina in 1983. For me, Solferino, around 120 years earlier, is the origin story, if you like. The Red Cross was involved in the creation of international humanitarian law and the development of the Geneva Conventions, a set of treaties and protocols which were put in place to regulate conduct during war and, amongst other things, to establish the proper treatment of the war dead. One early legal requirement meant that the dead must be buried in national groupings. We can really see this in the mass war graves and cemeteries of the World War I Somme battlefields, for example. It's an early example of the later demand to individuate and identify the dead. Across the 20th century, several international tribunals started to investigate mass atrocities and seek justice for the dead. The 80s and 90s saw a number of major political transitions take place. These were states that were transitioning from violent authoritarian rule to democracy. For example, Argentina and Chile had both experienced murderous military regimes, killing and disappearing tens of thousands of critics and opponents. Both held investigations into these atrocities, Argentina in 1983 and Chile in 1991. Argentina famously drew on forensics evidence from mass graves in order to do so. It mobilised the dead to testify to the crimes of the past. The dead were effectively witnesses from the grave. Alongside this political history, new ethical values had become embedded in many scientific practices, including in forensics. This led to the Minnesota Protocol, which set out the principles for the right treatment of the dead in forensic investigations. The Minnesota Protocol sets out, amongst other things, 
the responsibilities that forensics experts have to the families of the dead. So the ethical treatment of the dead starts to be more clearly articulated as treatment that's bound up with relations with the living. Since the 1980s, the idea that exhumation and identification provide solace to families who are at last able to properly mourn and bury their dead has become a core principle in the way forensics are applied to humanitarian issues. But what happens in situations where there is no centralised, concerted forensic effort for families to rely on? Since 2006, Mexico's war on drugs has killed over 330,000 people and disappeared more than 80,000. These figures don't even include the unknown numbers of undocumented migrants who were killed and disappeared on their journey through Mexico. In the absence of state investigations, non-governmental organisations and the families of the disappeared have taken up the forensic investigations of mass graves by themselves. I'm wary of repeating the regular mantra that violence in Mexico started in 2006 when the war on drugs was launched, because this mantra hides the fact that the Mexican state had been killing and disappearing its opponents for decades before that. But 2006 is important because it saw President Felipe Calderón very marginally win the general election, and because his election win was so tenuous, it led him to putting on a show of force in order to underwrite his authority. He launched his war on drugs, he put the military on the street, and since then, deaths and disappearances in Mexico increased exponentially. Contrary to what most media reports would have us believe, criminal organisations and the state are responsible for torture, for killings and for disappearances in Mexico. One thing that's commonly said about Mexico now is that it's one large cemetery. There are thousands of clandestine graves, and municipal cemeteries and the morgues are literally overflowing with unidentified human remains. Some have started to call this Mexico's forensics crisis, and this has some truth in it. But this label conceals a much more important picture, I think. So on the one hand, it's true that the country lacks the capacity and resources to manage the huge numbers of unidentified dead. But at the same time, the crisis in Mexico isn't a forensics one. It isn't a technical one. It's a political one. And the reason I say this is that the production of mass death is due to the state's historic and ongoing involvement with organised crime. Its complicity is reflected not just in the scale of the violence, but also in impunity levels, so the state rarely investigates these crimes, when it does, the results are generally unsatisfactory. This context the scale of the violence, the numbers of dead and disappeared, and the fact that the state is doing little to investigate and prosecute, has mobilised families of the dead and disappeared. Families have joined together, they've created collectives and organisations to search for their disappeared relatives. They've been collecting their own DNA for matching with human remains. They've been searching for and identifying mass graves, and because they've become so forensically literate, They've also started monitoring official exhumations to make sure that officials are carrying out their work properly. One of the things that's commonly said about the victims in Mexico is that they got what they deserved, because they were involved in drugs, organised crime or whatever, and the families are themselves stigmatised by association with the dead and the disappeared. And what's interesting to me is that this forensic activism is a way of challenging this narrative, of resisting stigmatisation, of making the problem visible and embarrassing the state for its inaction. The way in which forensic techniques have been adopted by family members and other non-experts in Mexico tells us a story about what we feel we owe the dead and what is owed to us, the living. Is all of this forensic activity, both now and historically, changing our relationship to the dead, especially the mass dead victims of atrocity? Is it generating a new set of rights for these dead? And if so, what are these rights? Dr Claire Moon identifies several key themes that emerge consistently over time. There are three central rights that come up time and again, both within international humanitarian law, practices of recovery of the mass dead, and also within forensics protocols. And these are the right to identification, the right to return to families, and also the right to proper burial. 
So these are the ones that I've been concerned to document just to say, look, there are already existing rights and they're being practiced. Where I think these rights can be understood as human rights is that within law and forensics practice, there's one quality that's conferred on the dead that determines how ideally they should be treated. And that quality is dignity. This is also the quality that's central to the idea of human rights. It's what determines how humans are ideally to be treated in life and also in death. It carries over into death. It's a residual quality, we might say. Arguably, it's what's left over of the human after death. This question about whether the dead have human rights is important in two ways. First, I think it potentially transforms the way in which we regard the dead because we normally think of the living as the only subjects of human rights. But secondly, it potentially transforms the way in which we regard human rights itself because it demands the incorporation of new categories of the human. Thinking about the dead in this way means they get incorporated within the category of human that's at the centre of human rights. While the living may behave as if they have obligations towards the dead, practically conferring rights upon them, it's true that many human rights make no sense in death. Also, the dead can't claim rights for themselves, nor can they bear any responsibility towards others. To address these objections, I've come up with a provisional formulation which is the human rights of the dead, but for the living. It emphasises this relational quality. And this is crucial because it concentrates attention on what's important to the whole field of forensic humanitarianism. And that is the importance of the dead to the living, that ongoing relationship. And it's that relationship that determines the right treatment of the dead, particularly what we owe to those dead who've suffered what are called bad deaths, that is, Deaths that deviate from social ideas about a normal death and the proper rituals that attend it. 